Mr Grundy is operating on Peter Cheswick Charles, who lives in the Channel Islands. My name's Peter Cheswick Charles, I'm 52 years of age, and I live in Alderney in the Channel Islands. I'm taking part in this programme so that I get the chance to show other people not to worry about having this operation and let the surgeons do their job. But let's go now live uh, to the theatre, to Southampton, to meet uh, Paul Grundy and the team. Hello, Paul. I hope you can hear me. Perhaps you could tell us what we're looking yeah, at. Yeah, hi. I can hear you. Can you tell us what yeah. we're looking at? Um, absolutely, yeah. We're just opening up the bone here. You can probably see, if you've got a view of this now, that we've taken off a big disc of the uh, bone, the skull bone. I'm just working with a bit of awkward bleeding from beneath the bone edges. And, um, just nibbling it off to give us the best access to this to this part of the temporal lobe. We need to get low down here. Just taking a bit of extra bone off and then we'll open up in a second. So this bit's not desperately exciting, I'm afraid, but you see the dura is a thick rubbery membrane here over the brain. This gentleman's had an operation before and it's all very scarred down here from where he'd had that operation. I just need to spend a few minutes just giving myself the best possible view of things. Maybe Crispin could talk through a few things from the anaesthetic side of things, tell you what, what he's doing to keep things under control at the moment. Yeah, we've got the Peter here. I don't know if we can get the camera onto the, uh, onto the pumps here. We've got uh, uh, running both sedation and pain relief. Uh, very low amount of uh, sedation, uh, with, with a rather higher amount of, uh, of pain relief. He's mm. it's, it's, it's reasonably sleepy, as you can see, but if you ask him to do anything, or to, he'll, just, he'll just open his eyes nicely, and he's, he's just about where we want him. So that's fine. But in a minute, when we get to stage, and Paul exposes the brain more, where we go on to do the mapping of the surface of the brain, to see whether he has any areas that may be uh, vulnerable in terms of speech, then uh, we will be reducing this down further and having him more alert than he is now. Paul, can I just uh, ask you, we've had a lot of questions uh, already, and, and the most popular one at the moment is, why does the patient have to be awake for this? Uh, yeah, it's a very good question. The, the answer to the question is that we, it is our preference here to if, we, if we're ever operating on a tumour which lies anywhere near to a vital region in the brain, and by which I mean those that, that might control speech, movement or feelings, then we would elect to do that operation awake. And we, and we do that for two reasons, principally. The first is that before we start operating and removing sections of the brain, we can test them with a small electrical probe, which we'll be doing in due course. And what we need to ensure is that those areas are silent, they're electrically silent before we uh, remove them. And the other thing we can do, of course, whilst we're working on the brain, a bit of bone wax, please, is, um, is to test the patient continuously. Now, it so happens with this patient, who's left-handed, there's actually a moderate chance that when we, when we look to test his speech function, we find... Uh, that the speech function is not located in this hemisphere. Now obviously that will be very reassuring for us, we'll know we can go on and, and remove this part of the brain without risking him. So that's what we hope to find really. Thanks, thanks for that. Well, yeah, now, wh While Paul continues to cut away the dura to expose the brain, uh, we've got a piece of tape uh, now in which he explains the clinical assessment. When we first looked at the MRI scan uh, and the series of MRI scans of Peter, what we, what we first noticed were some, was, a, was an area of swelling in the brain. The tumour which has started off in the temporal lobe is now starting to grow even beyond the limits of the temporal lobe into other adjacent parts of the brain. And this tumour we know is only growing very, very slowly, just probably in the order of a couple of millimetres every year, but it definitely is growing. This is a, a cross-sectional image of the brain, looking at the brain from below. You can see the eye very clearly and the ear on the side. The tumour overall now is, 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 is seven or eight centimetres in maximum diameter. This is thickened, expanded and it's white when you compare it with the uh, brain on the other side. 
If we don't act, it would seem inevitable that his condition is going to deteriorate. We don't want him to lose more memory, we don't want him to develop speech problems, so we want to act now to catch this while we can. Yeah. Those and, are the two things that I would imagine if, you know, if, if they were to happen. And once we're into the procedure, Paul is going to be talking to um, the patient quite a lot and, yeah. and trying to get responses. Now, again, it's possible that the speech could come and go in that. Um, what he, what he will, we'll see him do first is to, once the temporal lobe is exposed, is to actually just stimulate with a little electrical probe the area of the brain that he's most concerned might, might, be, might carry speech. And what we will see if it does carry speech is, is what's called speech arrest, where we'll ask Peter to count, and he, instead of counting to ten fluently, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, what he will do is go one, two, and then there'll be a gap in seven, eight, nine while the brain is stimulated. If, if, if Paul picks that up, then he will know that that bit of the brain he has to leave behind. If, however, he can stimulate the area he wants to remove, which he's going to locate with a computer guidance uh, system that he's got, uh, then he will he'll be safe to move it and we'll go ahead and do so. It's unlikely if the stimulation is negative that Mr. Um, that Peter will have a problem with his speech during the okay. during the procedure. Let, let's see if we can go back to Paul. Paul, can you tell us what you're doing? Yeah, hi. That, that is we the brain, is it? The mm -hmm. So we can see the brain here. A little hole in it down here, which is where he's had a previous operation of biopsy. The rest of the brain looking quite clear. You can see the lower part of the frontal lobe here, separated over by this vein here, which is called the sylvian vein, coming down to the lame vein. It's quite an important vein here, running backwards. And then this is the temporal lobe at the bottom that I think you've seen uh, earlier on this evening. So this is the section of the brain that we want to be able to remove partially. The first thing we need to do is just test, test it to make sure it's uh, silent. It's not doing anything important. So let's just have another line that's gone in, please. And then the cortical stimulator. You're okay for stimulator? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We've got your... Uh, Two million. Yeah. Can we just fill up the bucket uh, from when we've got the ice on All right. Yeah, we need the ice saline. Could you we just have explain? have saline on standby here, just in case we uh, have any seizure activity. We irrigate the surface of the brain with, uh, with a cold saline solution, and that kind of numbs it for a while, stops any epileptic activity. Yep. So we've got that ready, yeah? Yep. Loads of it? Yep. Yeah, we need full saline. Very good. Paul, could you explain what right. you're about to do? Yeah, so what we're about to do now, if you can see, okay. we've got a view of the surface of the brain yeah. here. Just in your way, just... I've got a little probe here, a little electrical probe. You can hear it buzzing. It's passing a tiny electrical current yeah. between the yeah. tips of the instrument, about five millimetres yeah. apart. Just, just minute, and that will stimulate different parts of the brain. Hopefully, so we can identify that none of them are involved in his speech. Yeah. And if we can identify that, we can then safely go on and remove some of this brain. So, we need to do some speech tasks okay. now. Is he okay for talking yeah, now? Yeah, yeah. Now, Peter, can you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, Start I want you to do counting. some counting, okay? Nice and slowly. One, two, three, four. Loud as you can. Yeah. One, okay. two, three. A bit louder. Four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, Go on, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, Let's start again. 20. Okay, then from one again. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Yeah, yeah, you can relax. Right. Two forceps. Do a four million ounce thing. Okay. Okay, so, so that was a negative good. test. Uh, small. So far. Well. Okay, we're going to raise the current slightly and try again. 
Okay, okay. one again. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Okay, I think there's just a little bit there. Twitch. Yeah. Facial twitch? No, well, it, 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 it probably was facial twitch. It could have been speech right, How are you doing? Okay, thank you. Yeah. You feel alright? Yeah. Just give me a smile. Let me just yeah. this little bleed okay. right here now. Okay. Okay. Uh, it may have been facial muscles that are made. Maybe, maybe the motor strip, that's okay. Yeah, right. it said it didn't look like probably uh, facial. Okay, how you doing, Peter? All right. Okay, thank you. It's a bit of surgery, so I've got this over the jaw here. So let's just look for facial twitching again. So, okay, what we might see now is, as David or someone might be able to explain to you on a model, yeah. is um, stimulation over the part of the motor cortex controlling his facial movement. Now we know that the speech centre of the dominant hemisphere lies immediately in front of that. Right. So if I can find the motor area there to his face and the area in front of it is clear, we're, we're, we're nice and safe. So let's have okay. a cortical stimulator again. Counting. Counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, okay. Is it twitching? Uh, right? It's That's not twitching the face. Huh? That, looks, that looks like speech arrest. Is it? Do you want that again? One, two, three. Yeah, give me a second. Give me a second. Just relax. Just relax. There was no obvious facial twitching. Right? No facial twitching. Okay. Just speech. That looks very like speech arrest. Okay. Yeah. Just, just, just squeeze that. Squeeze that. Okay. 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 Ready? There you go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, four. Yeah, speech arrest. It's definitely speech arrest. Yeah, it's definitely speech arrest. So this is his dominant hemisphere. Oh. Okay. Neuropsychologist was wrong. Okay. Um, hope she's not watching. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. Just that this is the dominant hemisphere. Okay, try again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Now importantly, over the whole area that I intend to resect, okay. there's no mm. speech arrest. And How again. Alright. Yeah. You one, go again. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 9, 12, 13, 14. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, every time. Okay, so, so you get to every time. Okay, so not okay. Oh. You know, Peter, so, you understand that? You've identified rockers, this is the dominant hemisphere. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. just Clearly, to show why you need to do these operations awake, you can't believe the test that you have beforehand telling you that it's not dominant. Oh, and importantly, though, the bit of brain that we need to operate on is, is silent. My planet, please. So, two things. Do you understand that? Two things we've achieved there. Yeah. One is we've found the speech area, mm -hmm. and secondly, we've identified the area that we're going to operate on. Oh, it's yes, clear. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, but we're going to keep you chatting now. Yeah. Okay? Okay. Paul, if I can just clarify um, yeah. to those people watching, what you have established is that that part of the brain that you've been putting the electrodes on is, in fact, the area that controls speech in the patient. Is that right? Yeah, this is it's one of the areas. This, this is the area actually in the lower part of this frontal lobe, just here, which is called, we call it Broca's area. Now, importantly, speech sites are very variable, one person to another, and you can also have them up here in the top, in the in the upper part of the temporal lobe. But as we saw, when I stimulate over this area, no problem with this speech, only in the frontal lobe. But we're we're safe because we don't need to operate on the frontal lobe. What you can see if you look at the brain here, I don't know if you've got a view, is this superior temporal gyrus, this thin strip of brain here is more white and pale than this part of the brain here. And that is exactly consistent with what I'm seeing on the navigation system when it's there. If you look here, which on the scan there, right, right in front of me, is also white and abnormal. So that's containing tumour. I wouldn't have the confidence to remove that unless I'd done this awake. We have done it awake, so we know we can safely remove that area. Okay. My photo, please. So what we're going to do now is just make an incision through the brain, through the back of the temporal lobe here, first of all. 